right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All welcome to the session on uh, Safe Learning, Safe Futures, Addressing Gun Safety in Education. I am Dr. Kalisha B. Graves. I serve as the Chief Research Education and Programs Officer at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta, Georgia, otherwise known as the King Center. And so today our panelists include Lori Alhadef, who is the founder and president of Make Our Schools Safe. We have Nick Saplina, who is a senior vice president of law and policy at Everytown for Gun Safety. We have Nicole Hockley, who is the co-founder and CEO of Sandy Hook Promise Foundation. We have Dr. Christina Kishimoto, who is the founder and CEO of Voice for Equity. And we have Daniel Lee, who is the founder and CEO of Kokomo 24-7. So as we know, certainly ensuring school safety is one of the most pivotal issues of our time, and it's certainly a multi-layered priority, and not just for administrators, but for students and teachers alike. At the King Center, we have a saying. We say it starts with me, and so I want to start the discussion there about what it means to transform school cultures. And so if we can start with Lori and Nicole, if you all can discuss the work that you're doing in schools uh, with uh, both uh, students and teachers, but particularly through the lens of youth agency. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Lori Aladef, president of Make Our School Safe. My husband and I, we started this organization after the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. My daughter was Alyssa, who was murdered that day, and we turned our pain and grief into action, starting this nonprofit organization, Make Our School Safe, and I also am on the school board of Broward County Public Schools and currently the chair of the school board. We have Make Our School Safe clubs in our high schools where students help to create a culture of safety within their school. So if they see something, say something, and we can prevent violence from happening before it happens. Also our Make Our School Safe clubs, they help to foster collaboration with their peers so they have a voice for school safety. We say your voice is your power and also we give back college scholarships for the students and we give back donations for school safety projects in their schools like bulletproof glass, fencing, mental health programs in their schools so they have the voice and are empowered at their school to be a part of the safety at their school. Thank you, Nicole. Um, my, my background story is very similar to, to Lori in some respects. I launched Sandy Hook Promise one month after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in which my youngest son Dylan was killed in his first grade classroom. And I really just needed to answer that question in my mind of how, what could have been done to prevent this. And the more I learned about that shooting, the more I learned about other school shootings and mass shootings in general or even individual shootings, the theme that constantly was coming through was about warning signs, leakage, the ability to create an intervention before violence happens, as, as Lori said. And from a youth perspective, um, Sandy Hook Promise is a nonpartisan organization that is really focused on how do we unlock and support youth across the country to recognize warning signs of someone who might be at risk of hurting themselves or someone else? How do we increase their social skills so conflict resolution, anger management, inclusion, being good humans, and also giving them a seat at the table for these choices because they are, this is the, this is the school uh, shooting generation. They are practicing lockdown drills. They are walking through metal detectors. They are being marketed, or their parents are being marketed bulletproof backpacks. We don't ask the students enough questions about what does safety mean to you? What does it mean to feel safe? And how can school climate, school connectedness help create that for you so that you don't have to go to, through a metal detector? So that's really what we do is focus on teaching youth and the adults around them across the country how to recognize these signs, but also how to create more connected school communities, which is really what upstream violence prevention and safety is all about. So I know at uh, Sandy Hook Promise, you all are really engaged in research, and so I wonder if you can talk about the importance of research in terms of driving broad consumer uh, awareness to create change. Sure. Um, research is critical, and there's a lot in the gun violence prevention and school safety space that is research-based. We do a lot of PSAs um, that have really talked about warning signs and signals and creating that public awareness that 
school shootings and violence is preventable because too many people think that it's not or, you know, it'll never happen to me. It's not going to happen in my neighborhood. It happens everywhere, as we all know. But also, it's about how do we get this across um, the country to really unlock that for others. So this education piece and the research behind it is so important because I'm always amazed that when I look at the last 10, 11 years, the amount of focus on school safety, Pew Research, Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Surveys, all of the research saying that we have a problem, and yet as a country we're still very much focused on reactionary measures that have no evidence base to support them. So we focus a lot on where there is research and build that research where it needs to be. So that, like, there is no evidence base at the moment for things like armed teachers or hemorrhage control measures, or even lockdown drills and active shooter drills. Where there's developing research bases is in things like um, anonymous reporting systems, which is something that we focus a lot on in terms of building the evidence around that. And where there's clear and consistent evidence bases is in upstream violence prevention, threat assessment, and anti-bullying, social skills. Um, you know, in some places you can't really say social emotional learning anymore, but it's really about those social skills that are, that are needing to be unlocked in kids. That is consistent. So we're continuing to build that research base, not only to let people know what to do, but also for schools uh, and administrators to understand, don't do the reactionary measure. Invest in the upstream violence prevention, because that's where you're going to have the most impact, and the evidence proves it. And just so we can clarify terms, when we say upstream and downstream, can we explain for the audience what that means? Sure. Um, an analogy is always an easy way to explain something. So if you um, imagine that you are standing in front of a rushing river, and there are, this is a Desmond, uh, Desmond Tutu um, quote for those of you who know, and you see students, they, they're, they're, they're going across you, they're drowning, they're struggling. You can reach in and pull one out, but you can't save them all because there's so many. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu said if we went upstream, if we didn't focus on what was right in front of us, but went upstream to find out why were they falling in the river in the first place, that's how we create it. So upstream violence prevention is more on creating connectedness, creating inclusion. It's less on imminent danger or postvention and more on how do you stop an event from happening in the first place? How do you stop the kids from falling into the river? Because that's the way to save them all. So upstream really is around creating a, a, a culture of safety, if you will. Uh, moving now to thinking about policy and advocacy, Nick, your organization is one of the largest gun violence prevention organizations in America. So can you discuss for us uh, what your organization is doing to help or to help uh, institutions frame uh, their school safety policies, but also what you're learning from your work with some of these institutions? Sure. Sure. Thanks. Um, well, you know, certainly a lot of policy is that much more upstream too, right? It's how are you creating the laws or, or incentivizing the programs that can avoid the bad outcomes before they happen? How do you stop the kids from being pushed in, into the river and going downstream? And so at every town, we advocate in all 50 states and the, fifth, and the federal government uh, to make change, make change to policy, uh, incentivize programs, work on culture, uh, to, to change what is now an incredibly intractable problem. I know one of the themes of this uh, conference is seeing hope, you know, and having the courage maybe to see a bit of hope. And I think those of us that are in the gun violence prevention movement space know that hope is a condition precedent for change, that you actually have to be able to see, to, to quote Desmond Tutu, I didn't know you were a fan too, uh, but you know, hope is, is being able to see light despite all the darkness. And what, you know, what we know in the gun violence prevention movement space is there's a lot of light out there. There's a lot of reasons for hope that are, in fact, moving the, the dial on gun violence, are reducing gun violence. We have the evidence uh, to support it. So, I mean, we work with, uh, you know, mostly in legislatures. That's kind of what we're known for. Our grassroots uh, arms, Moms Demand Action and Students Demand Action are showing up in state houses in far-flung corners, uh, in the hearing rooms that nobody else knows about, and making sure the voice, voices of, uh, you know, the majority of Americans are being heard and not just special interests in those rooms that are advancing really bad ideas like arming teachers. And maybe that's something I've learned. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of insight, right? I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, 
uh, national education organizations are now focusing on gun violence, not because they want to, but because they have to. And so we are working with the national PTA, the uh, NEA, the AFT, all have come to us saying, we'd like to work out a platform. We'd like to work out uh, you know, a training manual for, for our administrators or our, our parents and teachers of what they can do. Uh, because shockingly, you know, this, this surprised even me and I do this, um, National PTA did a, a, a poll, a national poll last summer, uh, uh, or maybe it was earlier than that, about like what are parents concerned about? This is post-pandemic, kids are coming back to school. They assumed, they went into this poll assuming that the major concern would be education loss uh, you know, because of the pandemic, because of remote learning, because of missed days and all that. The number one concern far and away was safety, was gun violence in schools. At an education conference like this where everybody is innovating for like the next thing that's gonna help kids learn better, I just don't see how you can help kids learn better when they're surrounded with violence, the fear of violence in their schools. And for many, I don't know if folks saw the folks from Chicago cred on stage or who are facing violence before they get to school or after school. Schools in some places is the most safe uh, place for, for a student. So what are we learning? We're learning things like active shooter drills, which makes some school administrators feel like they're doing something, can often be done really, really poorly, not in a trauma-informed way, not in an age-appropriate way, not with parental consent or notice, uh, and the harm is real. We did a study with Georgia Tech uh, to analyze social media um, uh, well-being, like in, from parents, students, and teachers, immediately after uh, these drills and you saw spikes in depression, anxiety, concern, and how do you learn? How do you learn in that environment? Um, the idea of arming teachers, which you know, in some corners uh, of the country gets, gets its hearing, even gets passed into law, is us in engaging in a collective delusion that your, your, you know, your English teacher is all of a sudden going to turn into uh, you know, a special operations soldier in one of the most hectic, horrible moments that you could possibly imagine, is going to be able to train a gun on a bad guy, probably a student of theirs, and, and, and pull the trigger and hit what they're shooting at. I mean, it's just, it's delusional, but it just shows, you know, to give them some benefit of the doubt, how desperate we are. But we have solutions. We know what the solutions are. We know how to reduce school shootings, but it's not by putting more guns in schools, and it's not by terrifying our kids uh, with drills. It's by upstream policies, both legislative and programmatic, like the ones that Nicole works on, and that, that can really make a difference. Yeah, I know what it means to be terrified uh, by a, a, a drill. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, looking at the state of Virginia lawmakers table, Delissa's law, and uh, the... the uh, it was cited, the school board cited, that funding was a concern. So I wonder if you can give us some insight on what Alyssa's law is, and then what, are the, what have been the challenges you've noticed in, in passing this law in various states? So Alyssa's law is panic buttons in schools. So if there is a life-threatening emergency situation, whether it's a medical emergency or an active shooter situation, we want to empower our teachers to press a button, and it's directly linked to law enforcement so they can get on the scene as quickly as possible to take down a threat or triage any of the victims. And when that button is pressed, pushed, law enforcement can pull up the cameras within the schools and get eyes on the scene and better direct their SRO exactly where to go. We've passed Alyssa's law now in six states, New Jersey, New York, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, and Utah. And then in Oregon, we have two and a half million dollars funded for Alyssa's law and next session, hopefully it will get passed into law. And some of the issues I have to say is just that lawmakers are not aware of this technology, even though we have it in our banks, we've had it forever, and, and it's a common, like very common sense safety measure. So it's that, as, you know, creating those layers of school safety protection in their schools and mass notification in the life-threatening emergency situation, pressing that panic button so we can get help on the scene as quickly as possible. On Valentine's Day six years ago, I just remember thinking, I, well, I texted my daughter Alyssa, I told Alyssa to run and hide that help was on the way. And unfortunately, that help didn't get there fast enough. Wow. Dr. Kishimoto, you are three times superintendent. Uh, 
working at both the district and state levels. And so I wonder if you can give us some insight on what it means to work with boards, around educating boards around some of the policies that are needed. So I got two questions for you. So that's the first part. Part two to that question is, how do we ensure that funding doesn't become the reason that we don't enact the policies that we need? Yeah, so both great questions. Um, one of the things um, in my experience with three different systems uh, in three different states is that they're all very different. The policies are different. The laws in each state are very different. But at the end of the day, the safety of our children is the same everywhere. We want them cared for. We want our staff to be safe. Um, and as the superintendent, one of the things that um, that was really important for me was to ensure that we were really proactive in, in the work that I was doing as a superintendent with um, uh, having the board members talk about safety, um, have uh, a, a time period where they would retreat, take a look at our policies, look at what we're, fun what we're funding. Uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, which was considered one of the most unsafe districts and, and cities in the United States and a very safe uh, uh, state uh, until we had Sandy Hook uh, a couple of years later. Uh, you know, we were, we, we actively gave floor plans to the uh, board members of each school and the uh, police department, and we did cross-training, board members, police department, and then parent reps uh, and teacher reps at each school, um, not because there was an incident, but because we said we have to be proactive about this. Um, and so uh, Sandy Hook happened, we were one of the best trained staff in the state of Connecticut. Um, our staff were all called out. I had to sign release for them all to go, unfortunately, um, uh, to Newtown uh, to provide support. Uh, and we uh, 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 just were, as everyone else, in shock about what happened in our state. But it was, it was a, a lesson for the board and for other board members uh, to, to, to start talking about these issues. Of course, so much has happened since. I went then to Gilbert, Arizona, to a board that wanted to know in my interview if, if I was okay with them uh, giving a gun to each uh, teacher uh, as, their, as their safety protocol. And I said, okay, we're gonna take a couple of steps back and we're gonna really talk about safety. Here we have open campuses, you can't lock them down like Hartford, Connecticut. You can't, you don't have the, the, uh, the systems of um, uh, videos that we had in Hartford, very different situation. How do, you, how do you ensure that you have safety on campus grounds that are 40, 50, 60 acres around a high school? Um, or even around an elementary, huge campuses. Go to Hawaii, and in Hawaii, uh, campuses are completely open. Kids go to school without shoes on. Um, it is a, a more fluid campus. How do you ensure safety there? So the policy conversation with each of those boards was very different. But there's a couple of things to keep in mind, especially in this environment where we have such a divisive kind of political environment now with boards and, and the conversations that are happening is that the number one responsibility of a board and a superintendent is to have the conversation, is that you can't let the politics of divisiveness shut down the, the conversation and say we, we know how to secure our schools. And that was really important. In terms of funding, one of the things that I always made a point of is I, was, I wanted my legislators to know what I needed to secure my buildings. Uh, but before the ask, I had my board fund first. So we provided the proof first in order to go after the funding after. And then we said, look, we took this, this in one situation, we took a million dollars off the top, put it towards some things that, that I can't disclose, put those things in place, went to legislators and said, "This is a, we took a million dollars away from academics. I need you to give me that money back because you want me to focus on academics. Now that I've secured, it's like what Nick said, now that I, my kids are safe and my staff are safe, my principals are safe, now, now we can instruct. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also working the politics of policy and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's about knowing how to work it. Can I just add something to that? And by the way, we brought Sandy Hook yep. team to Hawaii to talk with us. Yeah, you didn't bring me though, so we'll have to <laughs> work on that. Um, funding should not be an issue, period. Mm -hmm. There is ample, first of all, money should never be a barrier to saving a life. 
without a doubt. Secondly, there is ample funding available, and, and sometimes I think we forget about there that. Is. I know, um, you know after Parkland uh, in 2017, we had written the Stop School Violence Act at a federal level, and it passed after Parkland as, as our Congress struggled to figure out something to do. That currently supplies um, over $194 million to schools across the country to implement upstream violence prevention and security programs and, and, and everything. It covers, the, there, it's a grant system, it is available, and it doesn't get spent every single year. Um, I know grants can be difficult for some schools and districts to do. It's why we created our own grant team so we can be the primary and do all the work for school districts as well, because we don't charge for anything that we do. So there's ample funding, plus there's a lot of state funding. We've, we've already passed the SAVE Act in Ohio and Louisiana that mandates violence prevention programming and also are working on two other states right now for that, as well as other laws to help protect and allow this to happen and to have the funding to do it and effectively implement it and then research it afterwards. So money is available um, federally and state-wise. There's always a way to get around that. Absolutely, absolutely. Daniel. Daniel Lee, yes. you are something of a lone ranger on this panel because you are a technologist. And so if you would, sir, please do give us some insight on the work that your organization is doing on the school safety front and then the lessons that you've learned. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, first of all, thank you for having some of the panelists. I've been following your work. I've been admiring it. And um, again, um, you know, with that said, I'm a technologist um, and a founder of uh, Kokomo 247. We have worked on school safety since 2018. Um, with all the views and you know, challenges that we are talking about, I, as a technologist, I think I can synthesize everything in three perspectives. Uh, the first one, efficiency. Second one, accountability. And third one, the most important one is interoperability, which I will explain what those are. But efficiency, you know, it's just, as a technologist, we know we have used technologies that's available, that can streamline, you know, automate a lot of things that can save time, which can in turn save lives. And there's a best practices known. So, not just to you know pitch any technology, but you know looking for uh, you know uh, solutions or technology that streamline the best practices is the uh, you know one thing that I been trying to do. And secondly, is the uh, accountability. I am not talking about blaming anyone. It's more of I would say micro accountability. What that means is just empowering every levels of your organizations or processes or whatnot giving them a you know, digestible you know, accountability so that people can get things done, so that nothing falls through the cracks. Some of the early warning, not only just responding when certain thing happens, but if you are uh, having this type of micro, you know, minute tasks taken care of, you will have a bandwidth and uh, you know, um, the insights that you may potentially prevent from by discerning the signs and things like that. And lastly, the most important thing about the solutions that drives me uh, um, crazy as a technologist is that there are so much of point solutions out there that, you know, just around the pro protection or responses, but not much about the prevention aspect or having a holistic, uh, you know, kind of view or approach around safety, not just a, you know, visitor management system, not just a, you know, some, um, you know, a camera system that detects gun. Of course, those are work. However, as you may know, transportation department, you know, district operations, mental health, um, you know, uh, social services and facilities, they all buy different disjointed systems and, you know, some, it's just that does not work. So I like to say that, um, you know, school safety should be approached in a holistic and synchronized way with, uh, by adopting uh, some sort of a uh, roadmap about platformness. So, so that school district as a whole has a one single point to be able to discern, digest, and react and respond and eventually prevent. Um, so that's what I saw as a, you know, 
uh, technologist uh, in, in terms of school safety. You know, Kokomo 247 has been around five years. Uh, we've been serving one of the largest metropolitan school district, number two actually, LA nearby. And they are one of the great examples of starting with a couple of solutions five years back. Now they use this holistically anonymous reporting system, tip, uh, panic button, you know, various other aspects in a, a single platform. So they can manage 700,000 students. Otherwise, you know, basically it's, it's an impossible task. So with that said, um, you know, basically I wanted to say no technology will be able to fix or cure uh, school safety. However, it can make it easier with the guided you know, tool sets and processes known to be of best practices to be used by you know, uh, schools. Um, I mean, basically that's why I built Kokomo 247 yeah. five years ago. Well, in as much as we are at ASU GSV 2024, we would be remiss if we did not speak about AI and the implications of AI in this conversation. So Daniel, mm -hmm. you, have, uh, you, you can start us off on what are the implications of AI when we talk about school safety. Uh, Nick, I know there's some deployments at every town for gun safety is looking at it. And then Nicole, I know you have a human-based services uh, angle on this. So let's talk about the implications of AI. Daniel. Yeah, so I will try not to, uh, you know, kind of bore you with the technology. So I <laughs> attended air show. I don't know if uh, some of you attended um, at the convention center over the weekend around all AI in education. I saw a lot of fear and, you know, misunderstanding. Uh, misunderstanding. I wanted to say quickly, AI has multiple uh, uh, pillars. All the shiny things that we talk about nowadays about ChatGPT, OpenAI, is are something called gen generative AI. That's one of the six pillars of AI. The oldest, the most achievable one is something called predictive analysis by using machine learning. What that means is machine can actually learn by feeding a bunch of data, such as incidences, the anonymous tip line, all those data can be fed into a system and the, pro, uh, the uh, software or whatever can actually build a model that can actually detect a pattern. So for example, if I were bullied my, in my third grade, and sixth grade, I got into fight, and seventh grade, I, you know, something happened. As, if we log these things, uh, for as an example, school district of 700,000 students, there's no way a human can remember me going through all this that I will become suicidal. I mean, even worse, you know, other things. Those technologies there. So, you know, adopting that is, I think, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of AI, you know, just scratch all this ChatGPT thing. And in order to do that, um, schools can actually, um, you know, should start collecting data structured way. It's not in Excel in somebody's hard drive, right? So that's, um, that's you know, a pet peeve or that's the thing that there's some Thing, technology wise, something that we can take advantage of right now. It's just, um, yeah, the, so that's, that's where AI should be uh, approached in terms of safety, mm -hmm. then ChatGPT or any other things. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, we know the policies that work that can save lives. We know uh, the, the signs, right? We know that three and four school shootings are committed with a firearm. From that was in the home or the home of a close relative. So we know that locking those guns up makes a difference, right? We know that assault weapons and high-capacity magazines make uh, tragic shootings even more tragic because of their sheer firepower ability to fire rounds. We know that really in almost every school shooting, there are warning signs. Mm -hmm. um, so we know this from the social science, and the question is how do you operationalize that kind of knowledge? And uh, I will say, one thing we don't know very well in what is arguably the number one public health issue facing this country is like any kind of real time understanding of gun violence in this in this country you know during the pandemic we had cdc figures every single day tracking mortality infection rates we understood it we understood it at a macro level and we also understood where we could like zoom in right now there there's no, there's nothing like that uh, the cdc our cdc data is 18 months old 
right? Like that's like that that's what we have to rely on. So one of the so knowing that we have solutions, knowing that we don't have great visibility necessarily into real time understanding of gun violence, what we're building at at every town is a an, a knowledge base of gun violence that can then be accessed, uh, you know, potentially with predictive systems, uh, that would be the goal. But in the meantime, by advocates and, and practitioners who need to get access to that to, to make decisions, policymakers, et cetera. What does that look like? That is, that is built on top of, um, that is using generative AI uh, to pull basically everything we know into a place, training the system up on it um, in a, in a you know, including on structured data, including on uh, news articles about gun violence that sometimes are our only evidence point that gun violence is occurring in a place, um, and pulling that all into one place that can be easily accessed by an end user that can ask the, the system questions uh, and get real and reliable and non-hallucinatory answers uh, from that system. But I agree very much with, with Daniel. I think the future deployment has to take that knowledge base and apply it to real people uh, because the fact is, and as Nicole's program has proven, right, we do know, we, we can know the signs, but literally being able to see them, get them into a place and then have action taken on them is, is, one, of, is one of the challenges I think technology could be leveraged, um, not just in school safety, but in a number of other forms of gun violence uh, that are, you know, far more common and, and every day uh, in the country. And so that's what we're trying to do through a project called Every Town Labs. That's what we're building, uh, and we're we're pretty close to you know having we, we we have an operational version of that that has a lot of ways to go. If anybody wants to collaborate, if there are technologists in the room, uh, happy to talk. Uh, but that that is that is the goal for this program. Absolutely great. And uh, from a from a school safety perspective, I'm also interested in how AI can help humanize an issue. Um, there is no, there is a lot of misunderstanding around AI for sure, and we need to have more research on this. And I think, in terms of a holistic school safety plan, there is definitely an interesting um, way that AI and uh, or detect or monitoring can come together with anonymous reporting, can come together with threat assessment. And the way those three can work together can be very powerful if the right processes and rules are in place. Um, so we're doing some pilot work at the moment because we have an anonymous reporting system as well, very similar, um, technology-based. We're, we're in a couple of dozen states at the moment. We have big data in Pennsylvania and North Carolina who are two state partners. And we're doing significant research with the data from North Carolina where all middle school and high schools have our anonymous reporting system. So we can then overlay demographics, socioeconomic status, culture, and also, and also overlay natural language processing to try to understand what's going on below the, the surface of the tip. When we potentially add AI to that, and this is what we're doing in terms of more on the monitoring side and what's coming up from social media monitoring or um, school computer monitoring, we're doing some pilot work right now in two districts to say, are we seeing the same sort of tips coming up through AI monitoring and, and that, that factor, is it combined with the anonymous reporting system and is there a greater knowledge base that can be created? Do they, do they overlap in terms of students trained to recognize the signs reporting and what AI is telling us and then how we feed that into threat assessment teams to help work with the schools to help ensure that we have the full picture of a child's journey? Because I know with our anonymous reporting system, we have a significant paper trail on, on an online paper trail, not really the same thing, but we can tell like, is a child, is there, are they escalating down the pathway to violence? Are they moving within the district and how do we track them across? How does that school know? And we're also doing some pilot work with a healthcare system to say, because a lot of these school shooters, unfortunately, well, most school shooters are also ideate on suicide. So how do you, if they're going, if they're being seen in hospital or for mental health intervention or for suicide treatment, how can we help create the correct safety nets for them when they go back into the school system? Non-punitive measures are super important. Yeah, I'm pointing right back on you. It's all about non-punitive measures. So there's an interesting intersection between AI, anonymous reporting system, and threat assessment that we need to learn more about, and that's what we intend to do. 
And I would just add, add like total total agreement with with Nicole, which is always like a good place to be. I find like we uh, hate each other. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, but but we but there's you know again learning a lot because this is not my normal audience and being here and 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 hearing so much like when we when, there's also something to be said and uh, you know right across the hall there's a there's a talk about AI tutors right and there's a talk of the the uh, you know pervasive tutor the you know the AI that wakes you up in the morning and gets you to class and reminds you about the thing, prompts you along the way. If, if these types of solutions that are education focused aren't looking at mental well-being, if they're not taking in and maybe processing risk and, 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 and I you know, feel very strongly uh, to, to get additional support and not punishment, um, then we're missing the mark. And again, you're not educating somebody when they're dealing with some maybe crippling trauma at home or, or are you know, if you're not looking into student wellness with these solutions, then you're not going to actually educate them uh, successfully because we know that student exposure to gun violence in particular, student fear of gun violence, but more generally, student well impacts educational outcomes. This is news to nobody uh, who's in the education space. But yet, we're solving for like a very different problem often, or the conversation appears to me to be solving for a different problem. Uh, and we have an opportunity with this to, to intervene, to say, to, to have uh, these systems solicit the kind of input uh, that, that could actually get kids the help they need. Absolutely, I know we're running out of time. Uh, Lori or Christine, any final comments? Thank you so much. I just say to join the school safety movement, go to makeourschoolsafe.org, learn how you can get involved. And if you know any high schools who want to be joining our MOSS clubs, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you. I was just going to add that I, I think just bringing the various comments together, there's just this, this dangerous cocktail of, you know, the the isolated conversations around Second Amendment rights, the isolated conversations around SEL and whether whether we're anti-SEL now. I'm not quite sure why anybody would be anti-SEL, uh, but we have that. And then we have the shutdown of just conversations around policies and all of that coming together. It's really dangerous, obviously, for society, but especially for our kids. In Hawaii, as we came out of the pandemic, we had uh, we have very low number of guns in, in the state of Hawaii. And and the lowest incidence of guns, gun rates, uh, gun violence rates in the nation are in Hawaii. And so that's a good situation, but we had this huge escalation, the largest escalation of self-inflicted, um, you know, suicide ideation and, and suicides um, by, by young people. And from, from early elementary, all of a sudden into the teenage years. And then, and, and then we started hearing this backlash around SEL. And, and, and so how do you have good policy discourse and make good decisions contextualized to your community unless you can talk about you know what that policy looks like relative to community so as much as we might say we have some ideas around policy I also think that local context is critical um, uh, to be specific to what's happening in neighborhoods and communities absolutely ladies and gentlemen all we do thank you that concludes this panel thank you